This lecture, lecture six, is going to be on the same period as the previous one, the five dynasties period, that is, but instead of seeing works that I believe to be really from the period, or at least closely after paintings of the period, this time we're going to look at the uh, probably better known paintings uh, that are attributed to the five great landscape masters of this period. Uh, many of them actually works of later times that we'll see. I begin this lecture with a picture of several of my younger colleagues, whom I've mentioned in different connections without introducing photos of them. From the left, there's Dick Barnhart, uh, Richard Bar Barnhart, that is, uh, Frida or Alfreda Merck, Jan Stewart, who was formerly at the Freer Gallery, now is the British Museum. Uh, the woman next to her I don't recognize, I can't tell you who it is. Richard Vinograd, then. Richard Vinograd, long my student, long ago my student, I mean. Um, and he's taught for many years at Stanford, and getting close to retirement, I think. <clears throat> he's the co-author of the Thorpe Vinograd book. And finally, uh, at the far right, Jerome Silbergelt. Uh, the photo was made as at a Chinese restaurant, as you see, on Valentine's Day in 1987. In the previous lecture, I talked about some paintings of the Five Dynasties period, which I take to be um, genuine original works of the time, and which uh, revealed a certain kind of interest in certain kind of spatial compositions that I talked about in detail. Uh, this one will be about the great masters of landscape painting in the Five Dynasties period, works attributed to them. Before continuing with that, however, I'm going to show two very different paintings of the period. These are uh, in the Palace Museum in Taipei and are titled Deer in an Autumn Forest and Deer Among Red-Leafed Maples. They are two hanging scrolls now. Originally, they were very probably panels of a screen, and they may be works by artists of the Liao dynasty, or the Kitans. Uh, I talked about the Kitans at the end of the previous lecture. Uh, the the Kitai, their, old, their name for their territory is the origin of the European word Cathay, and I showed a landscape by probably by a, by a Liao artist. Okay, here anyway are these two, two great paintings. Originally, they were, here, now let's see, they were parts, I say, of a single composition. Uh, they're not, this is not the complete composition by any means. There may have been five panels um, stretching quite a distance uh, laterally. Now, these two don't connect, but they seem to be the left and right parts of the, compos on, of the composition. Why left and right? Because two things, really. First of all, you see a stream which uh, begins somewhere well above the bottom in the left panel, what, are, what I take to be the left panel, and it continues below in the right panel. So it was flowing through the whole composition and at different levels in these two. Secondly, something must have been happening between these two that startles the deer, because you see the deer in both cases uh, turning to look uh, at, uh, at something else as if they're startled by some noise. What this was, we don't know. Another kind of animal, who knows, question mark. But the, um, the two great stags that uh, are the principal, mm, whatever, father figures, so to speak, in both compositions, um, turn. The one at the left turns his head only very slightly. He's much too dignified to turn around as the others do and look. The does tend to raise their heads and look back toward the center. And the, the other one on the other side uh, the, 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 the stag, again, raises its head to look. So uh, we assume that something, as I say, some noise or something startled them, and, um, and um, uh, there's a reason they were looking inward. Now let's start looking at details. Next, please. Here is the uh, detail of the one on the left with this great stag. Now, this, these, these paintings have been extremely popular and famous. Everybody loves them. Everybody wonders at them. Why didn't the Chinese do more of this? <laughs> and um, wonders about certain uh, qualities of them, which are indeed rather strange. The painting of the animals is superb. Uh, animals, wild animals and their natural habitats have never been painted with more understanding and uh, naturalism and all the rest of it than these have. Uh, these are artists who 
knew these creatures very well. They, they uh, went on hunts for uh, deer and um, uh, deer figure in their wall paintings and so on. Um, another quality of these paintings, which has been quite a mystery, let's go, go on to the next, please. Uh, okay, let me put that off for a minute and speak again about the uh, sheer, uh, the superb rendering of the uh, of the animals. This is the head of this main stag, looking slightly around uh, at whatever is uh, attracting his attention. Not quite enough to, you know, turn completely, but uh, anyway, uh, its eye. Uh, the modeling of the creature with uh, shading is wonderful. This is, well, this is, among other things, a heritage from the Tang. We saw pictures of horses, and uh, particularly the one attributed to Han Gan, now in the Metropolitan, that gives some suggestion of what underlies this superb painting of animals. The Liao were also great followers of the Tang dynasty. They presented themselves as the, 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 the real heirs to the Tang. Now, next please. Here is a doe hidden among these red-leafed uh, red leaf trees uh, detail. Now the other qu big question is why do we see things through other things? Why are there white uh, tree trunks and white areas of leafage and so on? Well the answer I'm pretty sure is that there was originally heavy pigment on these areas <coughs> built, <coughs> built up into a kind of relief which has come off. Uh, when they're on the screen it's possible to have heavy pigment uh, but when they are taken off and rolled as hanging scrolls, which they have been now for centuries, the heavy pigment gradually flakes away, and you have only the underdrawing and the underpainting of white with the, uh, with the what, what was heavily built up uh, gone. Now, uh, I was uh, given the job of writing an essay on, uh, on uh, Southern Song Academy painting, but yeah, but including these two, I don't know how they got in, but anyway, um, for the catalog of the 1986 Metropolitan Museum exhibition of paintings from the National Palace Museum in Taipei, the catalog called Possessing the Past. And I'm going to have that on the study guides from here on under the title Possessing with references for uh, discussion, but also for pictures. At any rate, in that essay, I cite or quote an 11th century writer who gives the advice that you can tell a good painting from a bad one by running your finger over it. And if you can feel the pigment, uh, it's not a good painting. So um, the heavy buildup of pigment into the kind of relief uh, that we originally was here must have been common in the earlier periods and had gone out of fashion by the Sung times, so that if it was there, it was not a good painting and so on. Uh, Liao probably were old-fashioned in this and other ways, but also, as I say, it was possible on, on a screen to build up the pigment, which then comes off when the screen is remounted as a hanging scroll. Oh, hang scrolls. Okay, here another area, uh, an old dead tree, another detail, an old dead tree on the uh, left here, only white, but probably, but certainly with uh, the bark and, and pigment built up, built up in heavy pigment originally and more of the uh, maple leaves, uh, or le leaves of, of foliage, and another quite wonderful young, younger deer. Uh, well, okay, so much for that. These are re truly great paintings. Um, and we wish we had more of them, but just these two happen to have survived. It's known that the Liao people, uh, well, accepted tribute from the Sung, but also sent gifts to the Sung. And they're recorded as having sent a six-panel screen of this type, representing deer in a forest, to the Sung. This, this is not necessarily from that screen, but just to show that, that uh, paintings of this kind were done by them. Okay, um, now we go on to look at something else. Uh, here is one of two wall paintings, also clearly of the period, I mean, dateable as it, as it happens, uh, from... Um, from the um, uh, um, tomb of a certain Wang Chujur, who died in AD 923. So uh, these are uh, these these are datable to the early early 10th century. 
And uh, there's a number of wall uh, paintings in his tomb and very fine reliefs. I'm not showing those because they're a little bit outside our, our uh, interest, but uh, a pair of wonderful uh, reliefs showing Palisades in uh, marble painted. Anyway, uh, the landscape paintings, this and the other one I'll show, are, as you see, somewhat fragmentary, but they're interesting as the uh, uh, reliable works of the time. <clears throat> and here we see again, we've seen it before, this technique of uh, representing the folds of the mountain, parallel folds representing furrows or eroded slopes. I'll show more of that in a moment. And uh, shading in these, shading by uh, uh, ink strokes, not clear, clearly repeated strokes that comes later, but anyway, ink strokes. And this way you, you move back uh, from into a distance and build up your landscape form. There's somewhat crude here, uh, distant hills and that other thing, and trees. The next, please. Here's the other one, <clears throat> even less to be seen. And in front of it, a table with things laid out on it. This is to, uh, representing, as, as in earlier tomb paintings, uh, gifts to the deceased and so on. At any rate, <clears throat> these are, again, um, uh, materials that we have that are actually from the period, and so they can show that this mode of painting was becoming common at this time. Now, and here's a uh, next, please. This is another of those fragments from Central Asia. I've shown others before. Um, fragment of landscape, in this case. Still another uh, from the late Tang, or shortly afterwards, showing the same system of shading. Uh, uh, in uh, from fold to fold, it's the f f shading is fairly even, not really distinct repeated strokes. The, uh, it's working toward that, but uh, repeated strokes, what comes to be called tsunfa, texture strokes, belong to a later period. Here, it's a matter of outlines, and then shading from one to another. The trees, as you see, are shaded to give cylindricality. Okay, this is another of these. Um, of these um, uh, pic pictures that give us some uh, evidence for five, di uh, five Dynasties landscape style. Now, here are the next, please. This is very interesting. This is a double picture divided down the middle, as you see. And it comes from um, a reproduction in a magazine called Urinasu, or sometimes called Ikuro Zashi, a private magazine published by a Kyoto collector named Okumura Ikuro, rich man who could have his own magazine and write, write all the articles in it and reproduce lots of pictures in it. Really interesting, rare now. Uh, issued in the mid-1930s, he issued five volumes and then stopped. But anyway, this is taken from an article in the fifth issue of Ikuro Zashi, uh, or Udinasu, and it's an article by him on called Mountains and Pictures of Mountains, in which he juxtaposes photos of real Chinese landscape with paintings of it. And here, interestingly, the right section, right part to the right of this dividing line, which you can see, is uh, a detail from a painting in Japan attributed to Fan Quan. It's not a painting I'm showing, and it's not, not terribly important, so um, uh, I, uh, you, we don't have to look at the whole thing. But anyway, then on the left, he reproduces a detail from a photograph of... Um, of an actual mountain slope in northern China. People down below on the path working, as you see, building a road. This is a, 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 a furrowed uh, mountain, uh, mountain slope of, in what's called Lusk country. Lusk is a, uh, a soil built up by wind-blown dust coming down from the north over many many, not more than centuries, aeons of time. Anyway, um, an, an actual photograph. And the two match surprisingly well, as you see. Um, so, um, uh, it, this is very revealing, that is to say, to, in, that the artist had a natural basis for this convention. We can see what it's meant to represent. Well, this is something we all do. We all put photographs beside paintings. When we toured China for the first time, we went around making photographs, which we said, oh boy, this will be great to put beside the something-something painting. Um, 
it's it's uh it's it's a good game. It doesn't doesn't tell us as, uh, as much as some people say. I mean, real doomkops, real dumb dum dums, point to these pictures and say, look, look, the artists are only painting what's there before their eyes. What's all this stuff about style? They just paint what they see. That's stupid, stupid, stupid. Um, it doesn't work. And it's only made by outsiders and beginners. Nobody who's seriously involved with Chinese painting could say that. There's a huge difference in the landscape style of different places and times. Well, the real landscape obviously doesn't change that much. Anyway, uh, it's a simple point to make, but I think it needed making. So just, if you hear that kind of thing, forget it. Okay, now there are two more diversions I'll show before we come to the great masters. That is paintings that don't quite fit, but I think I'll show and then leave. Um, this one, now on the screen, is, um, is titled Fishing in the Clear Stream. It's an, an anonymous picture, made probably based on a 10th century composition. The real age of it is somewhat problematic. But at any rate, it has a lot of what is archaic in it. It's painted in the linear style, such as we've seen before, line and some colors I remember, uh, not, not heavy color, but at any rate. And um, you know, trees spotted through the composition and so on. At the same time, it's the kind of composition with a central mass that is developed in the uh, Five Dynasties Northern Sun period. Well, as I say, it's a rather mysterious painting. The, the, the foreground down on the lower right is somewhat close up to the viewer, which means a later date usually. And various uh, figures, fishermen and so on, spotted around through the painting. Anyway, I reproduce this in the second chapter of my compelling image book and write about it, so I'll just put it in here and drop it. Next, please. This painting, uh, anonymous again, after maybe a 9th or 10th century composition, but somewhat later in actual date copy, titled Immortals Dwellings on Pine Hung Cliffs. Both this and the previous are in the National Palace Museum in Taipei. This one we discovered in 1959, I remember very well, when C.C. Wong and Li Lin San and I were going through the painting collection of the Palace Museum, what Li Lin San called the Three Painting Worms, and um, this painting came out. Never published, seen for, not, <laughs> not seen for the first time, but certainly seen by uh, modern people. I mean, uh, hadn't been published and hadn't really been noticed. Uh, it was simply called Anonymous Sun. Well, it's like in some, in a simple way, the John Chen composition that uh, Tang, actually Sui Dynasty painter, uh, short hand scroll that we saw, in that it has two sides uh, with a river separating them. One side with a lot of detail and the other further away with less. But here it's a, it's a, in a vertical composition and, it's, and the uh, nearer side has much more detail and so on. This, is a, this kind of river landscape continues to be popular in, um, in Chinese landscape. But the foreground here, again, is much too close up for it to be a really early composition. Uh, early comp early paint Chinese landscape, hanging scroll landscape paintings didn't have this kind of easy entrance. Now let, let me um, show some details. The next, uh, maybe beside the original, the upper part of it. Um, it is like the um, what the uh, Emperor Minglong's journey to Shu in that the uh, the line drawing is in firm even line, and the clouds are hard edged and uh, the, the, the buildings are much too large for the size of the hole and so on. So it has a lot that's archaic in it, along with other things that are uh, up to date. Uh, up in the top you see temples, so it's another painting which you have steps going up and you move from a, uh, an area of uh, human occupation up to a, an area of uh, religious uh, symbols of religion. On the uh, plateau here, you see a viewing platform. That's actually a later feature we'll talk about later. That is uh, something set in such a way that you can look out over the landscape, suggesting that people stop and look at, and gaze at the scenery instead of simply moving through it. We'll see that for the first time, I think, in a painting by Guo Xi. Okay, now let's we'll go on. Yeah, here's here's a close-up of the um, of the upper part, the bluff, with somewhat geometricized. Um, 
uh, drawing, which is a, a follow-up from Tong, obviously, but other very naturalistic features in the trees. Next, please. And then down below, uh, here we see people, three Gaucher or lofty scholars, seated under, under uh, pine trees, something of a favorite subject in later painting, one of them playing a musical instrument and harmonizing the sound of his chin with the sound of the rushing stream nearby and the wind in the pines. A popular theme, very moving. Okay, and then the servant standing around waiting. Okay, enough for that painting. This is uh, a, a painting that has much that's old, much that's later in it, and uh, interesting without being really part of the clear, uh, what, um, clear developmental story that I'm trying to show. Next. Okay, here we go. Now, here are, here is, excuse me, a painting attributed to Jing Hao, the first of the five great masters we're going to talk about. A painting titled Mount Kuang Lu, and a slide from the original, uh, and another slide made from a photo. I'll keep these on the screen as I talk. Now we come to the five famous landscape masters of the Five Dynasties period, along with Li Shishun and Li Zhao Dao of the early Tang, and Wang Wei from the middle Tang, they are recognized as the forefathers of landscape painting by later historians and critics. Lists of them always go Jing and Guan, Dong and Zhu, Li, Li Chang, Jing Guan, Dong Zhu, Li. Anyway, one could write a substantial book about them just from the information and the opinions that Chinese writers give us about them. And there's lots and lots of writing on them, in other words. And then um, the paintings attributed to them. Now, a lot of this is in Lur's book. He, he has these translations of writings about these great masters. And it's worth reading for that. And then, if we did write such a book, what would we illustrate it with? Do we have one painting that's safely by any one of them? No. Not as safe as some things that I showed, for instance, last time, under the painting attributed to Zhao Gan, the hand scroll of fishermen. That's very probably by, actually, by Zhao Gan. We have nothing as likely uh, as a genuine work of any of these five. Do we have a painting that's really safely after one of them? Uh, yes and no. Maybe one Dong Yuan. I'll talk about that when we come to it. But there's not anything that is so well recorded or has such a strong provenance or so plausibly attributable as the Zhao Gan scroll is. Uh, okay. Uh, there are lots and lots of attributions to them, on the other hand. All serious collectors in China wanted to own examples of their work because of their fame and their importance for the whole base, basic uh, foundings of landscape. People who had old paintings in their styles, or even imaginably in their styles, were strongly tempted to attribute them to Ching and Guan, Dong and Zhu, Li Chang, sometimes with added signatures. The modern forger Zhang Da Chen, whom I've spoken about before, did all of them. Oh, maybe not Jing Hao. I don't know if he ever did a Jing Hao, but You'll see his Guantung in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. You'll see his Juran in the British Museum. You'll see his Li Chung and Dung Yuan. No, oh, I won't finish that sentence. I'll stop there. Anyway, he did all of them except Jing, uh, Jing Hao. But at the same time, a number of old and fine landscapes survive that go under their names. And uh, we'll look at, the, at some of these in the rest of this lecture. Lur and Barnhart and others take these much more seriously than I do, as you'll see if you read read them. I would see them mostly as good examples of works done by artists in their in in the local schools or founded by the famous masters. <clears throat> what we call in auction catalogs and so on, School of Li Chung. That's a very honest appellation. Um, and that's what m most of these I, I think would be. So what I've been showing is the painting ascribed to Jing Hao, who's the oldest of the five. It's an impressive painting. It's over six feet tall. Obviously, it uh, has an effect of great space and height and grandeur. But later, I'll go on to show in a minute uh, why I think it isn't by him or even necessarily close to him, so why we probably shouldn't take it as representing Jing Hao's real style. This is a painting, as I say, titled the Kuang Lu Mountain. And I think it probably belongs in the Northern Sung period. And I'll bring it back when we talk about painting of that period in the next lecture to show why I think that. Well, he, Jing Hao is also the uh, author of an important essay, excuse me, attributed to him, the 
reputed author of an important essay. Again, it's not clear that he really wrote it. But uh, anyway, um, an essay that is translated, was well, translated in the Bush and Schur book, uh, which I'm constantly referring to, the early Chinese texts on painting, they divide up texts and put the sections of them under different subject categories, which I wasn't in favor of, and I don't think it's a great idea. But they, the, the text is all there, it's just scattered. But it's also a translation by by K. Munakata, Kyo, or Kiyohiko Munakata. I've talked of him before in connection with his dissertation. He did a very fine uh, translation of this text with notes uh, called Jinghao's Bi Fa Ji, A Note on the Art of the Brush, uh, published in 1974. Well, I'll talk about this text, this essay attributed to Jinghao, uh, while putting on the screen as I talk to give you something to look at, uh, some images of Huangshan, the great mountain range in Anhui province, photographs I made on one of my trips there. Uh, these are to illustrate the kind of scenery that the writer of this essay must have had in mind as he composed it. The narrator in the text is a young student, student of painting, who meets an old recluse in the mountains. Maybe the recluse is meant for Jinghao himself. At any rate, the old recluse uh, imparts to him the secrets of painting landscape. The old man affirms the importance of capturing some pictorial truth, some deep understanding of nature, instead of just transcribing appearances. So we have that uh, idea again, it's very common in early Chinese writing about, about landscape painting. He distinguishes between hua, or outward appearance, and sure substance. I say again that I'm no good on tones, probably all wrong, but um, yeah, and I'm sorry, I can't give you the characters either. Anyway, so we have to put up with that. He gives four classes of painting in descending order. Um, like the traditional ones, a little different. The shun or divine, the miao or marvelous or sublime. The qi or distinctive or strange, which corresponds to the yi pin I talked about before, the untrammeled. And the chao, skillful, which is like nung or capable. Chao, skillful. He, under, he introduces... Um, terminology and concepts from geomancy, which is the study of the underlying currents of energy in the earth, whatever you want to call them, geomancy, however you want to render it, uh, qi or spirit and sure energy. Uh, geomancy is still very much alive and very much affects how Chinese place their houses and put things in their restaurants and so on. He discusses earlier painters praising Wang Wei, contrasting him with Li Sishun. Already those two have become uh, the representatives of the forward-looking and the backward-looking, or the repressive versus the progressive tendencies in landscape painting. He praises Wu Daozi for the power of his brush, but he says he lacks ink, that is, his use of ink wasn't adequate. And another painter named Shang Drung, he prays for, praises for ink, but says he doesn't have bone in his brush, doesn't have enough firmness in his brushwork. He eulogizes old pine trees, somewhat anthropo anthropomorphizing the pine tree, as a, making it into a, like a, a human creature. He lists the six essentials of painting, which are like Sheho's six laws, but directed at the creation of a painting rather than as criticism. Uh, the six essentials, as he has them, are qi or spirit, yun or resonance. He says, hidden things take shape, the painting is not vulgar. These are, of course, the same as Sheha's first law, Qi Yun. Then Su, thought. He says, select and depict the most essential points. And Jing, scene, scenery, seasonal aspects. These are specific to landscape, underlying meaning versus overt visual content. C.C. Wang always used the term Jing uh, pejoratively as what you shouldn't look at in painting. You should pay attention to the brushwork instead. Um, it's not the scenery. Jing Hao's six essentials end with B, brush, brushwork, free and flexible, flying and moving, he says, and Ma, ink, shallow and deep, its colors natural. These pertain, of course, to the execution of the creation of the painting. Well, overall, these point to where landscape is going at this time, and it's important to recognize that. That's why the essay is important, whether it's by Jing Hao or not. That is to say, the artist aims at the reduction of visual variety towards some great unification that will somehow reflect the unity and order of the universe as was coming to be understood in Neo-Confucian philosophy. In style, this meant 
the reduction or elimination of color, a move into ink monochrome. In brushwork, it meant creating a system of brush strokes that produces an orderly system of forms, organized into a composition that reflects the artist's comprehension of an orderly natural world. It meant the creation of great systems of texturing earth and rock surfaces, brushwork systems for rendering forms such as trees and rocks and mountain peaks in ways that would unify the picture into a coherent vision of nature. Well, we see that in this picture. I mean, it's good to have this on the screen as I talk because this is an example of what they're aiming at. It's not the greatest example, but it's a good one, especially it's seen in the hole here. Um, a way of uh, organizing the picture into a coherent vision of nature, of the physical world. The fundamental problem facing the landscape was the translation or the transmutation of the observed scenery of nature into systems of brushwork and forms that embody or express an understanding of natural phenomena. Nature is presented not as a collection of individual forms, but as organic structure. What we'll see in this in the following lecture, then, will reveal how the great landscapists of China's greatest period of landscape painting carried out this grand project, creating what we call monumental landscape in paintings that can be taken, if we want, as pictorial expressions of Neo-Confucian thought. I don't want to overstress that. Philosophy doesn't create painting style any more than history does, or any other outside factor does. Artists create styles. But Neo-Confucianism, I believe, is the worldview that underlies this great collective pr project. Uh, and that's what is going to occupy us now for some time. And it's the real central matter of this series of lectures. So uh, there's a reason I'm giving it quite a bit of time and going on talking. Okay, now back to looking at the paintings. Um, this, as I say, is a painting, uh, is the uh, Mount Kuanglu. Now let's look at the details. I'll show you why I don't think it's the real thing. Now here we get up close. Here's a b much blown up detail of, the, of the, the middle left, that is, where the bridge and houses would be seen up in the middle left. Well, you see the trees, uh, they're not like what Jing Hao uh, advises uh, powerful natural paintings of trees. They're rather crotchety and repeated and not really top class at all, not, not, not great art. And the same with the outlining of the rocks. It's sort of shaky. And um, well, so the artist, in other words, uh, you, uh, vibrates his brush to give an effect of, of energy. But uh, it really isn't, is not, it's not the real thing. We'll see details of really great paintings by Fan Quan and others uh, that will show you what the way it should be. This isn't it. And here, the architect, the drawing of the architecture and the trees and so on, is not up to, up to par for what, a, what a, a, a great artist should do. So I think it's a pretty good painting of Northern Song Date by a lesser artist, maybe using a composition somebody else invented, but using a very impressive composition anyway. Um, well, anyway, so much for that. I'll bring it back when we get into the Northern Song period. Now going on, <clears throat> here's a, a painting attributed to Jing Hao in the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City, Landscape with Travelers. Laura reproduces this, Barnhart does, they discuss it. This is an archaistic work, and for me, it's a much later work. I don't take this as seriously as they and others do. Um, Larry Sickman acquired it in China and uh, believed it to be a, uh, a, a very important early work associated with Jing Hao. It actually has a Hong Guzhu signature somewhere. Uh, Hong Guzhu was a name used by Cheng Hao. Now, Larry Sickman didn't make many mistakes. His, his successes were many more. But I think this one here, he didn't, didn't quite hit the mark. Okay, let me show the, show the details. Um, I won't do this in great length because it doesn't deserve great length. Uh, everything is painted, as you see, in white with ink. Now, this is meant to look like the underpainting of a painting that originally had a lot of other stuff on top, pigments. But in fact, the under, this is the white is all there is, actually. In other words, it's a big painting made to look like the underpainting of a landscape that uh, never existed in full form, that is. Um, the trees are painted in combination of white and ink. The figures drawn here, as you see, in heavy white. Um, well, it's all there is. It's, it's also, I suppose, that the condition of it, with a lot of silk missing, is also artificially induced uh, paintings. They would take a, 
painting on silk and bury it or uh, uh, mix it with urine and other things that somehow deteriorated it and then dig it up and mount it, something like that. Uh, here's another detail here. With, you see the temple in the mountain. Tiny bit of color, maybe reddish color, but mostly it's just just white. And a, uh, a path going up toward or down below. And the whole composition is much too elaborate and for me at least, like certain late composition, maybe even late Ming or so. Okay, leaving that aside. Uh, now go, let's go on to the next one, which is much more important. Now the next of the great masters of the period was Quan Tung. Quan Tung was a rival of Jing Hao, paired with him by later critics, I say Jing and Guan, typically. And he was also active in the first quarter of the 10th century. And of the paintings attributed to him, this is for me, easily the most important, and with a certain plausibility as an early painting, a fine early painting, uh, more plausible than most of the others we're seeing as a real work of the 10th century. This is the painting titled uh, Travelers in the Mountains, and it's in the Palace Museum in Taiwan, again. Um, let me see, I'll just put the, the hole on for a moment. Uh, the 12th century, early 12th century catalog of Emperor Huizong, Xuan He Huapu, writes about him, quote, Guangdong's paintings are done in a fluent fashion with a small, small brush. And the more sketchy the brushwork, the uh, stronger was the life breath. The simpler the scenery, the deeper seemed the thoughts. His pictures had a profound meaning. They were noble and pure, like Tao Yuanming's poetry and Horo's music. No ordinary painter could do such things, end quote. Laura writes of him that he is said to have begun by imitating Jing Hao, but he later turned to older masters for inspiration. In later years, he arrived at a free, unlabored, sketchy style of great expressiveness, end quote. That, again, is a kind of typical account of an artist's career. He begins by imitating some master of his time, then he maybe goes back to the old masters, then he sometimes it's said that he began looking at the landscape instead of old other paintings, and finally he reaches his individual style and transcends them all. Anyway, okay, now we'll look at details of this. This is the first painting that shows a certain pattern that we'll find to be um, common, almost always there in, in monumental landscapes of the uh, Five Dynasties and, and, and Sung, and, or Northern Sung. And it uh, divides the painting by layers as you move in, in into it and upward into basically three uh, parts. The, the first part is just uh, everyday life scenes and you see ordinary people in them. Then moving upward you come to a passage with B Buddhist temples typically or Buddhist or Taoist temples, whatever they are, temple roofs. And then up above that just pure nature, uh, pure mountain peak. Okay, that's what you have here. Um, in what may be a very early form. Um, now let's see. Here, here's the first detail. The um, the trees, the bare trees here, are done for me in a way very different from those in the so-called Ching Hao painting. These are not simple uh, re repetitional; they're not very light because they play a very small part in the composition. But even so, like the two in the lower right here, they're varied. Uh, brushwork fairly strong. Uh, this is a village scene, being the sort of low, low level, <clears throat> uh, simple human element in the painting, and um, and uh, you see a village with uh, travelers, an inn. Inns are always representative, as I've said, by a flag out in front, and um, people resting in the inn, people drinking wine, people greeting each other people carrying luggage, and so on. So it's just very much a mundane scene. The drawing, next please. Here's a closer up. The drawing, is you, if you blow it up as big as this, it looks thick and cartoon-like, but within the whole context of the picture, uh, especially a hanging scroll, which is to be seen from some distance, it has to be as strong as this in order to hold its own, in order to be perceptible. So it's not uh, it's not overly strong. It's not really cartoon-like. It's just and so simplified and suited to the context of the whole picture. This is normal in not monumental landscapes. Next, please. Then, as you move to the in, up into the middle part of the picture, you see a path moving along the 
shore of the stream or river, uh, people on it traveling upward. Usually travelers in these scenes are moving upward toward the temple or toward the upper part anyway. And then it goes across a, a bridge here and it disappears behind overhanging bank and into some clouds and then it emerges again up in the upper right here. You see the path with figures on it moving upward again. Then up at the top, near the top, um, here in this uh, kind of ravine or under this overhanging mass is the the roofs of the temple. This is typically what you find in these landscapes. Sometimes the temple is more completely shown, sometimes it's just roofs seen over the crest of the mountain. Um, notice here that the uh, earth masses are modeled, not with texture strokes and not uh, anything like that, but basically with a fairly free application of wash and ink strokes and uh, to give them volume. Uh, and not much use of color, very slight color in the landscape, I mean in the um, uh, buildings and figures, but basically ink monochrome. And next please, here close up, there's the roofs of the temple buildings. They too are drawn uh, in uh, fine line, but the line of course is much lighter or, or thinner than the foreground buildings because they're meant to be seen at a distance. This is something we see over and over again. Further things are drawn in lighter line. Okay, uh, and here you see very well the surrounding uh, peaks and so on. The outlines are mm, continuous, not always continuous, but they tend to be, and fluctuating a bit in thickness, but basically, anyway, they're drawn in a very natural way, no simple thing. Uh, and here the great bulging uh, top. I should point out before we go on that the patches of fog or the mists in this painting are limited in area, serving to set off trees as silhouettes in a few places. In later landscapes, as we'll see, mists are typically used more extensively, especially to hide the bases of the main peaks to increase their, sen to increase their sense of towering height as though they are rising out of the mist. This more limited use of mists here is another early feature of this picture, strengthening the likelihood that it's really a pre-sung and maybe uh, Guantung work. This is, as I say, this is sort of on the way toward the way of representing forms that uses texture struck and so on. It could be transitional. Generally, as I say, this is plausible as a pre-sung painting. Now let's go on to the next one. That's an important painting, I think. This one, also in the Palace Museum in Taipei, um, this seems to me, this is the one titled Autumn Mountains at Dusk, National Palace Museum, Taipei. This is, for me, more a uh, 11th century painting, maybe Northern Song by style. Um, part of a series, maybe a screen. In a previous lecture, a painting, a big painting of a palace with uh, a view of the interior of rooms in the upper part, we saw landscape paintings uh, mounted in the wall, uh, ink on silk, and in series, in rows of them. And that gives you some idea of how these paintings were actually mounted originally. So much of what we have from early landscape painting consists of pictures like this one that appear to be parts or panels of what was a larger composition. Uh, this is also incomplete in subject matter. You don't see an easy entrance at the bottom. You don't see uh, figures making their way up and so on. Well, all right. Um, I think it's probably a panel from a very fine 11th century time of Gua Xi, maybe. This great ovoid mass behind the trees in the foreground uh, looks very much like Gua Xi. Uh, anyway, a, a fine painting of that time as preserved, part, only part of a bigger composition. Next, please. Here are the, just a minute, the detail. Just a second. Here we go. Yeah. Well, if you get in close, you can see, uh, again, as, as in the previous painting, a few indications of human presence or human passage through the painting or human, not quite habitation, anyway. A uh, little bit of color, blue mountains in the distance, bit of color on the bridge and so on, but basically ink monochrome. And, um, well, I won't talk about the uh, texture stroke and such because I think as I say it's not a painting of the period really. And then next please. And then here um, 
and the upper right part, the path continues, barely seen at the bottom, continuing going through the fog, like in the Guashi painting we'll see. And then way up at the top, just over the ridge at the uh, right here, you see the peaks of the roofs of what presumably is a temple again. Uh, very obscure in this case. Okay, a fine painting, but not so really. Worth mentioning here, before we go on, is an old, dark, mysterious painting attributed to Guantung that was in the Agata collection in Osaka, one of the paintings brought to Japan for sale in the early 20th century. The title and the painter's name, along with the date corresponding to 1111 AD, is written in the hand of a prince of that time. Obviously written in later, that is. Seen in the original, it turns out to be pieced together rather awkwardly from parts of an old painting by some Guashi follower, maybe Yuan Dynasty in date. From the detail, you say it's really pretty good, but not that early. Uh, it was a famous work for a long time, but when it came up for auction a few years ago, it didn't really bring a very high price, much disappointing the owner. Okay, now we come to the third of the great masters, <clears throat> and this is Dong Yuan. Dong Yuan, let's put this two slides, probably, up uh, to make up the whole painting. One of the, perhaps the most important of the paintings attributed to him. Dong Yuan, active under the Southern Tang, remember the uh, dynasty in the south that was, uh, the, of which the last emperor was Li Ho Zhu. Uh, anyway, Dong Yuan uh, died in 962, that is the very beginning of the, of the Northern Song. Uh, he was a great and mysterious master. He held an official post, that is, he was the assistant director of the imperial parks in the southern state of the uh, Nantong. And he's credited with, among other things, establishing a whole school of landscape painting that was regional, uh, the Jiangnan re uh, School of Landscape, Jiangnan being the Yangtze Delta region. So we have a whole regional school. This is not entirely new, but it tends to be new. And in this period, we have what may be, what seems to be, the beginnings of clearly regional schools of landscape. Okay, uh, this is the landscape of the Shaoshang region. Shaoshang, there are two rivers, anyway, in, uh, well, below the Yangtze. We'll come to the Shaoshang later. But it's a kind of uh, a region famous for lovely, misty landscape and famous in poetry and so on. It's a shorthand scroll in the Palace Museum in Beijing. Another picture like the, um, like the um, Gu, Gu Hongzhong Han Shizai's Night Banquet. It was owned by Zhang Da Chen and owned by him outside China. So people had a chance to buy it and missed it. And it went back to China, bought by the Chinese, and is now in the uh, Palace Museum in Beijing. Anyway, um, so here we have a, a, a scene um, with very simple, earthy, non-spectacular scenery, which is typical of Dung Yuan's paintings. And here, if you look at the upper part of the of this um, uh, landscape mass at the left, you see sort of lumpy tops of the, of the scene. Uh, that is as though they're kind of some hard or round, rounded things protruding out, out of the landscape. These are called uh, alum rocks or fanto. Um, and then as you, if you look closely, especially in the closer part here, you see stringy lines used to texture the strokes. These are called hemp fiber texture strokes. These are not the, the terms used by Dungan, of course, they're by later critics who invent terms to describe the recurring features of his landscape style. In any case, this is, as you see immediately, a deeply unlike the landscape we've seen up to now, like the Emperor Ming Huang's journey to show and so on, a new and distinctive mode of representing landscape. There's no narrative content to speak of, very little. I'll speak about that as we go on. Um, the, um, the figures are small. They play a fairly small part in the composition. And the scenery is the, the plainest possible scenery, like the real hills of the Jiangnan region, as everybody, uh, as everybody points out. So he's, he's painting his local scenery. Um, now, Dick Barnhart, Richard Barnhart, uh, published back in 1970 a very important study 
titled uh, Marriage of the Lord of the River, in which he argued quite persuasively, it's a fine piece of work, um, that um, the, this is uh, copied after a recorded composition by Dungran, in which the subject was not people making their way by, across the river by ferry, as here, but instead uh, was a, a local a fertility rite, or some kind of rite in a ritual annual, in which a maiden was sacrificed to the lord of the river, sent out on a boat, and uh, anyway, taken over by the by the lord of the river, uh, drowned, whatever. Um, okay, this is probably probably true, as he makes a good case for it anyway. And so it's been kind of cleaned up, or may, and given a more uh, agreeable subject here. On the left part, we see fishermen pulling in a net. We'll, we'll, I'll show that closer. Then we see the uh, in the in this right section, people arriving in a boat, and I'll show a detail of that, and um, other people on the shore waiting for them, uh, waiting to greet them, or waiting for the ferry, perhaps, to go back across. And um, then, as I say, in the distance, we see one of these hills with the sort of bulging, uh, what, bulbous uh, protrusions, the fondo, and so on. Um, okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> let's see. Next, please. Here's a here's a detail of the uh, of the central part with the people in the in the prairie. And here you can see better on the upper part the uh, the brushwork, the rather simple repeated brushwork, plain, unexciting, very different from the nor northern landscape that we've seen. The much rocky masses and spectacular scenery. Next, please. Even closer. Here is a detail close up of the people waiting on the shore. The, where you see the, paint, the figures in white, the white is probably just the underpainting of um, figures that were uh, done with uh, heavy, heavier applications of pigments over the white. And that, the, the heavy applications have come off again with rolling and passage of time abrasion. And all you have is the white undercoating. This is perfectly legitimate in this case, not not a, not a uh, detail that condemns the painting. And here, and here's very close up is the is the um, uh, boat in the center that's making the trip across. The boatman, uh, one boatman here, uh, pulling it or rowing it in, in the back, and another in the, uh, the front. And then these um, three uh, merchant or official people with heavier color in them and then a, a, a figure of lower social class seated there, one of their servants, all two of them under a parasol. Okay, the next please. Now if you look at the section, the upper part of the section at the upper left of the scroll, uh, you see better the texture strokes, uh, hemp fiber texture strokes as they're called. Well, I, I didn't understand what this meant until I remember making a car trip from Hangzhou to Shaoxing, and uh, going past a place where indeed they had put hemp uh, out, hemp uh, stalks out on the road to be uh, abraded and broken down by cars going by, and indeed the fiber did uh, gave, gave you an indication of why this term was used. It's kind of uh, fibrous and whatever. Uh, okay, and um, the trees done and also in very simple. Uh, way with dot dotting to give the foliage and so on. And down here, the figures, again, white probably underdrawing, uh, collectively pulling in a large net uh, to net the, the fish. Now then, um, in Nungan's paintings, you don't see a lot of variety, quite the opposite, a kind of deliberate monotony. Um, one doesn't enjoy the details so much as, uh, although there's some details in them, uh, as much as in, uh, in, in other kinds of painting where there's a lot of detail scattered through the painting and you make your way through it enjoying the details. Not so on Dungran. Well, this is a hanging scroll and it's a uh, winter landscape and it's in the Kurokawa collection in Ashiya in Japan in the 3000 book and lure and so on. The inscription written across the top is by Dung Shi Chang, the great late Ming mm, critic, painter, theorist, whatever he was. Um, and he says, this is the 
Well, there are two ways of reading it, strangely. This is the number one. This is the best Dungan painting under heaven, in the which is in the Weifu collection. Weifu was somebody's honorary name, or official name. Or else you can read it. This is the this is the best Dungan in the Weifu collection. In other words, Dungan may be hedging his bets a little bit, whatever. Uh, at any rate, uh, it's, uh, it's a tribute of a kind that Dung Shi Chang, who was shown the painting by the collector and maybe asked to inscribe it, wrote this and then the, this inscription was mounted up above the painting. Still there uh, in the uh, Kodokawa collection. Well, as you see, the, um, this is a composition of the type called Pingyuan or flat distance. Flat distance because the landscape stretches flat from where you're standing away from you into the distance. In this case, it stretches up above the top of the painting, so you don't even see a horizon. You see only this continuing stretch of landscape going back into distance. A, a, a writer of the uh, Middle Sung period, who I'll talk about later, uh, uh, talking about the different types of landscape, uh, it gives three distances, tall, high distance, uh, deep distance, and flat distance. This is definitely flat. At any rate, um, <clears throat> the, it's a picture of marshy ground which stretches to the horizon, which is up above the, the upper margin of the painting. And uh, a few houses are seen among the trees here in the uh, sort of far middle ground area and then a few hillocks and so on beyond that. And that's about all you get, not much of interesting, interesting scenery. Um, here, next please. Here's the hole in a softer image and a detail of it. Here, yes, these two softer image detail. Um, okay, um, now these reveal the truth, especially the detail, reveal the truth of what uh, we were told by later critics about Dungan's paintings. That is, that they are meant to be seen from a distance, not from close up. Close up, um, close up, they, uh, they, they didn't quite look right. Um, actually, close up details like this are revealing for our purpose, but, not, but they are a highly unnatural way to see the painting. Although you can, if it's hanging on the wall, you can get this close and see if this, well, if you see, um, if you have good vision. Well, you see the dots, the, the dian, uh, dot, dotting to uh, soften the forms. You see the hemp fiber tsun, all of that, and a very, uh, the drawing of, of uh, uh, trees and houses, all very simple and plain, I mean, deliberately plain. No attempt at variety, as I say, nothing, so the, very, the very opposite monotony. One, one doesn't enjoy the details as much as taking in the painting as a whole. One doesn't move through the painting, that is, as in other kinds, sort of enjoying this part and that part. Um, rough style. Said to arouse deep thoughts uh, in the, for the people who write about doing that. Like one can understand why they write this way, looking at such a picture. An early 11th century writer sums up pretty much all we know about Dungyuan. Quote, the principal master of his time was Dungyuan an excellent painter, skilled in painting the mists of autumn and far open views. He represents the real hills of the Jiangnan region, that is the Yangtze Delta region, and did not make any extraordinary cliffs, that is the kind of tall cliffs and spectacular scenery of other kinds of painting. Most of Yuan, Yuan's pictures, he goes on, are meant to be seen at a distance because their brushwork was very rough. Seen in a close view, the objects in his pictures do not seem right, but when one looks at them from a distance, the scenery and all the objects stand out clearly and beautifully, arousing deep feelings and carrying the thoughts far away." <clears throat> End quote. Well, there are, lots of, there are a number, there are quite a few other paintings attributed to him, um, hand scrolls. Dick Barnhart discusses them very well in the Marriage of the Lord of the River book, a Shang, uh, one in the Shanghai Museum, Summer Mountains another in the Liaoning Museum, and so on, and their relation to the Beijing painting. So I'm not doing all that. They're not very exciting and of somewhat, uh, well, questionable age, and so on. So not, anyway, we're not doing it. Uh, here, here instead, I show one leaf. Uh, this is the next slide. This is one leaf in an album of reduced size copies of old paintings, so-called Xiaozhong Shenda album, 
the great revealed and the small. Um, these were made for the artist collector Wang Shermin in the mid 17th century. Uh, and they're all with facing inscriptions copied from the originals of um, by Dong Ji Chang. So um, this and this one is supposed to be, according to Dong Ji Chang's inscription, this one is supposed to be after a genuine work by uh, by Dong Yuan. I reproduced this, by the way, in my compelling image book, in case you want to see it. Well, it preserves the composition, at least, of a painting that was considered at that time to be a genuine work of Dong Yuan. And uh, here you see very well the, uh, well, the uh, alum rock, the top, the lumpy tops in the mountain. Uh, you see a very uh, distinctive shape of the mountains. You see the uh, texture strokes uh, uh, defining the slopes of the mountains and so on. And the trees getting smaller. Now, how much of this belongs to the 10th century, is, it's hard to say. But again, here is a composition of the kind that was attributed to Dung Yuan, and was the kind of you may may well have painted. Uh, here, next please. I shouldn't leave Dung Yuan without mentioning that there are a number of forgeries of his work, and also of Dung Yuan's pupil Zhu Rong, whom we'll consider next, by the great modern forger Zhang Da Chen. This is a forged uh, photo of Zhang Da Chen in his late age, doing a famous huge painting that he. Uh, did in his last year and pretty much finished him, I'm afraid. And with him you see his daughter, Xing, who was my student, as I said in an earlier lecture. Zhang Da Chen understood this great demand by collectors in Japan and abroad, but also in China, for works by these two, Dung Yuan and Zhu Ran, and he helped to supply the demand and make his money for himself by forging their works with great skill. I knew Zhang from the time I was a Fulbright student in Japan in 1954, as I think I've said, and I became aware of his forgeries of earlier paintings later in that year. Several of them were owned by a Hong Kong collector named J.D. Chun, Chun Run Dao. I visited him, saw his paintings on my way back from Japan. Um, these are said to be now owned by a Tokyo dealer. At any rate, Chun Run Dao, J.D. Chun, owned paintings uh, attributed to Dung Yuan Zhu Ran, some by Zhang Da Chen, some just old copies, imitations, and um, published, actually published a book on them called Three, uh, what were they? <laughs> three, um, anyway, the, about three famous artists, the third being a, a certain Liu Daoshir, but anyway, leaving that aside, Three Patriarchs, it was called. Um, well, you can find out about these in, on my website, uh, jamescahill.info. I have a lecture there, CLP 16, a lecture on Zhang Da Chen's forgeries, and I have a long list with notes of paintings that I take to be forgeries by him under Zhang Da Chen's forgeries, under my written writings of J.C. So read and look there. I won't repeat all that here or show the paintings. I simply bring, bring it to your attention. <clears throat> now then, now we go on to the uh, artist Zhu Ran, Zhu Ran, who was a pupil of Dung Yuan active around 960 to 980. Juran was a Buddhist monk in a Nanking temple, uh, and on the Nanking being the uh, capital of the Southern Tang, and on the fall of the Southern Tang, he, uh, the uh, rise of the Song, he went to Kaifang, the early Song capital, along with Li Ho Zhu, and settled there. So he was active in the late Five Dynasties, the beginning of the Northern Song period. Uh, here is a very fine painting uh, attributed to him, National Palace Museum again, reproduced in the 3,000 Years book and Lur and so on, called simply Mountains and Woods. Well, you see, I put it beside the um, copy after Dung Yuan. They're, they're close in some ways in composition. And uh, this is not something against the painting. There's no reason why Dung Yuan's pupil couldn't do a painting that's somehow close to him in composition. At any rate, it's, uh, say, a fine painting, but probably a work of a slightly later period in the Juron style. The trees are done in uh, sort of misty groves, and, uh, well, the lumpy tops and things. I think it may be a Northern Song uh, imitation or copy, but still quite fine. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's a 10th century painting. It may well be, like others I've shown, part of a larger composition. It doesn't seem absolutely complete in itself. There are no figures or buildings in it, just this path that goes off and disappears into the trees. Um, 
um, anyway, I leave it open. It's a fine work. Uh, it, 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 you, we can learn a lot about the, uh, the proper use of the, uh, this is lumpy top uh, fonto uh, uh, convention or, or technique, and the uh, tape painting of the slopes with the hemp fiber to it and all that. So anyway, this is a fine work, but uh, uncertain uh, attribution to Juron. The next, please. This one, by com by comparison, doesn't seem to me all that fine a work. This is a very famous, uh, often reproduced picture. It was in the Chinese Art Treasures Exhibition and so on. Seren reproduces it. This is a book attributed to Juron, the one called Asking About the Dao in the Autumn Mountains. <clears throat> and this, by contrast, although it's famous and often reproduced, I say, is a much duller picture. One could argue that this is deliberate monotony, and, at least, and to be sure, Dungan and Juron had a certain, as I've said, deliberate quasi-monotony about their paintings. But here it seems to be real dullness. It really becomes hard to distinguish after a while if the artist is working what's supposed to be a dull style. But what if he's really a dull artist? I think that's the case here. The painting may be, may be Yuan Dynasty, maybe 14th, 13th, 14th century or so in date. I don't think it's earlier than that. Light color, anyway. Now I'll go on and show some details. Here, from the hole, let me just say that you see the path winding up from the lower right, making its way up the ravine, and then it disappears, and then later, later, you'll see a temple, as I'll show. Okay, the next, here is the foreground. Uh, well, you see the, the dien, the dots, are not, they sort of hover, vibrate apart from the forms as if they're sort of added on later. That's, I think, a later feature. Uh, dien dots, that's a term I haven't used before. But you see them here in the upper right and elsewhere. And as I say, they're kind of dotted on around the forms, or around the tops of the landscape forms, but don't, don't really adhere to them. That, I think, is a later feature. Next, please. And here... Um, a, a sub sub section of the main part. Here you see this path uh, going up and stopping at a cluster of houses. The subject of the picture, the title, is asking about the Tao, as though somebody, some traveler, has stopped in the house to ask a resident there how to get to the temple. And the, the resident <laughs> says, you know, keep on the path and you'll get there. So anyway, then you see the path continuing upward and upward and upward. And uh, you climb the path with him. But here again you see the real sort of dullness or repetitiousness of the mountain slopes and the uh, and the trees and all the rest of it. Here here it is up close. And here you see these figures, the traveler and the occupant of the house, the local person, seated. Uh, trees are you know, nicely done, but it's in a later later style. The uh, shading or the, the the variety of ink tone in the trees belongs to a later period. And here you see the hemp fiber tsun on the slope at right, done in its dullest, most uh, repetitious way. And again, the dien sort of hovering around the form. The next, please. Way up at the top, over the edge of the of the uh, uh, mountain, we see the dimly. The temple, the roofs of temples, Taoist or Buddhist temples, uh, through, through the trees. This is, I say, a sort of a standard uh, comp compositional type in which you ascend spiritually upward to reach this temple. Um, this being, as I say, maybe a 14th century copy anyway. We didn't even find these until the painting came to this country in the Freer, it was in the Freer Gallery before the exhibition at the National Gallery across the mall. And uh, looking at it, we we saw this temple anyway. Or actually, make, so making slides. Well, here just to just to finish is another section from the middle with uh, sort of plateau and hemp fiber tone and mountain uh, slopes and uh, tree groves on. It's it's fine, but unnatural, mannered uh, schoolwork later period. Okay, enough. Now then, onward. Here, and I, I can show only the original of the whole, I don't have uh, detailed slides of it. This is a painting titled Buddhist Retreat, Buddhist Retreat by Stream and Mountain in the Cleveland Museum. Now this is again a painting that probably, in fact in this case more very likely, belonged originally to a screen or a series. As I say, we saw an actual example represented in an early painting 
a couple lectures ago. Written in the, at the right of this are two characters that read Jew 5, meaning the fifth in a Jewron series or screen. And six panel compositions by him are recorded in the Shrenha Huapu, this early 12th century catalog. So we know that he did pictures and other artists did. In fact, the uh, artists the landscape of, of the early of this early period was often done in these larger compositions from which we have only single single uh, panels so they are they're somehow incomplete at any rate this is an early and fine painting very much worth having sherman lee of the cleveland museum the director in waigam ho who worked with him treasured it very rightly it's hard to find real early chinese landscape for sale there's a long very fine essay on this painting in the Eight Dynasties catalog, catalog of the 1980 exhibition of paintings from, as I said, Kansas City and the Cleveland Museums, by Wai Gam Ho. Uh, he somehow, he angered Sherman Lee by not writing enough essays for that catalog. A lot of things he should have written about didn't get written. And Sherman Lee had to come in at the last minute and dash off some stuff to put in, put in the catalog about all these Paintings that Wagam didn't get around to. Wagam worked very hard and spent a lot of time on anything he wrote, and he didn't do it easily. He didn't have the museum uh, curator's knack of writing something fast for a special purpose. Um, well, anyway, uh, but when, when he did write something, it was quite marvelous, usually. And in this essay on this painting by Wagam Ho, he makes the good point that Juron, the purported artist, in his late years, when he came north to Kaifeng, after leaving the Southern Tang, fell under the influence of Li Cheng, the fifth of the great masters, and the one I'll talk about next. And this picture, he argues, shows that influence, influence of Li Cheng on Juran. Well, this is a strong argument, um, and I respect Wai Gam, and uh, I think it's a fine essay. Otherwise, one might feel, as I would, that uh, as a would-be Juran, this has a bit too, too much of the look of Mm, maybe, again, maybe 11th century or so. Maybe it's something a little bit like Gua Xi in some respects, the way the t tree, temp tree groves are treated. And the lumpy tops are perhaps a bit exaggerated. <clears throat> that is, uh, too much lumpiness, too, too, li too much alike, the lumps, I mean, too repetitious. I think one of the one of the uh, beliefs that lie behind my discussions of early landscape and other painting, actually, is the belief that that um, within in a, in a sequence of painting within the sequence of paintings, um, uh, a given stylistic lineage, all attributed to the same painter, often, um, the priority within that sequ that, that group can be established by assuming that any element of style or any motif begins as a representational element, something that looks natural, that makes sense as part of a picture, and that it gradually hardens or degenerates into an element of a manner, turning part of a mannerist style, in which the later artist, uh, the later artist has learned this when he learns how to paint in the Dungran style or whatever. Uh, regional schools are established by these great masters with lots of followers doing imitations. And we know of these from early texts, and I think that most of what we have uh, uh, with the names of the great masters attached to them are in fact works by these later followers. We can sometimes try to establish priorities, say this is an early imitation or whatever, very close to the original. Uh, at any rate, um, these um, the, uh, the, the names of the great master come to be attached to these, often with signatures or attributions. And this is because works by lesser followers, so-called Xiaoming Jia or small name artists in Chinese, were not desired by collectors. Collectors, collectors didn't want Xiaoming Jia, they wanted great masters. So as fine and impressive objects with a little commercial value, these works of the followers were transformed by added signatures and attributions into objects that did have great commercial value, collectors being gullible and anxious to believe in them as they were. Well, this is a reality of Chinese paintings that we simply have to live with. We don't mostly have works by, for this early period at least, we don't have works by the great masters. We have school works, and school works are fine and, and worth having, and we have to take them seriously. 
Before leaving Juron, I'll show briefly two more old paintings attributed to him, both in the National Palace Museum in Taipei. The snow landscape on the left, with an inscription mounted above by Dung Chi Chong making the attribution, seems to me an interesting work of the Yuan dynasty or so. Dick Barnhart published an article in Archives of Asian Art, number 45, for I think it was 1942, reattributing it to an unknown, otherwise unknown, southern Sung artist named Feng Chin. In doing this, he inaugurated a practice that was followed later by Wen Fong and Jonathan Hay. It's a game I haven't joined in myself, uh, pulling a, native, a name out of a hat, that is, or out of an artist's dictionary, and assigning it to a wrongly attributed painting. But you can read their writings and decide for yourselves as usual. The other painting at the right is older and closer to Juron, I think, and it has a quasi-narrative theme. A man on horseback is seen approaching a temple, and he is supposed to be the emissary sent by Tang Taizong to steal from a monk in that temple the famous Wan Ting manuscript. Very famous story. Anyway, apart from that, it's a fine work in the Juron tradition, maybe southern Sung and date. Interestingly, you can trace a road from the Lower, lower right corner, across a bridge, through woods, to the temple, which is backed by high hills. All the familiar shapes are to be seen, along with the alum head rocks and the texture strokes. Now we go on to the fifth of the great masters of the period, that is Li Chun, 919 to 967 are his dates. <clears throat> He's another who founded a school, or a tradition of landscapes that would endure for centuries in the northeast of China. I'll talk about that. Well, I'll, I show, I'll show again in the remainder of this lecture works that are attributed to Li Cheng, um, uh, beginning, beginning with this one. Before I talk about them at length, let me just show this one and then go on to another one, which I think is, I have better slides and it's a better example. This is uh, uh, the painting titled Small Wintry Grove, Xiao Han Lin Tu. Uh, it's a shorthand scroll in the Liaoning Museum, northeast China. Um, on my website, in a responses and reminiscences, number 69 among the R and R's, is a story I tell about how once uh, with Larry Sickman in the Freer Gallery Library, when we saw a new publication from the Liaoning Museum reproducing this picture, Larry kind of laughed and made a face and told me the story about how he had almost bought this picture but failed to. Uh, he was, at the, it was at a time when the pictures, some of the pictures had left the palace and were owned by the uh, last emperor, Pui, uh, were potentially for sale by foreign, foreign buyers if you paid enough. And uh, he, he had arranged to buy a group of them and then the person who was with him and with uh, also involved in this sale, Langdon Warner, representing, I guess, the Metropolitan Museum, I'm not sure. Langdon Warner, anyway, uh, balked at paying the bribe to the to the go-between, which you had to pay to go for the thing to go forward, and the whole thing fell through. So Larry didn't get the painting. He went back to China and ended up at the Downing Museum. Anyway, so it's a shorthand scroll, ink, maybe some light color, on silk, uh, somewhat damaged, as you see. This is a poor slide. I'll have another one which is a little better, but not much better. I don't have good slides of this painting. Um, well, as you see, it's dominated at the right, at the left side here, by a group of tall trees stretching out in both directions. And then to the right of that, you have a, a lower tree reaching out, an old tree presumably, reaching out to the right. And then up above that, you have a bit of land indicating a uh, recession into at least uh, some depth. Um, well, it's hard to see, so I won't, I say, talk about it very much. But it's a type of painting that Li Chung becomes famous for. Um, old trees, uh, bare landscape, and so on. Uh, now let's go on. Another painting of the same title, now on the screen, um, Xiao Han Lin Tu. This one is in the National Palace Museum in Taipei. It is not actually properly attributed to Li Chung. It's simply called Anonymous Sung. But it belongs, I believe, among the uh, important early paintings that represent the Li Chung style. It's a, uh, another bare landscape with trees. And here down at the lower left, you can see two men 
and their servants sort of hurrying through the landscape. It's not a congenial landscape by any means. You don't look around and enjoy yourself. It's something, indeed, you hurry through. And then stretching beyond uh, at the right here, a very simple indication of uh, co continuation into depth. But uh, basically, it's a picture, again, of old trees on a uh, somewhat eroded uh, plain or a, 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 a landscape without not much, without much vegetation. Um, okay. Um, now here, let's see. The, in the next, uh, let's leave that on then for a bit while I talk about Li Chung, um, or maybe both of them while I talk about Li Chung. Li Chung came from a family of scholars, uh, distant descendants of the Tang imperial family, living in the northeast in Shandong province. Um, Wai Gong Po was doing research on him throughout his life on Li Chung. He uh, published a paper in the 1970 Taipei Symposium, it was quite important, and other papers. Li Chung, anyway, was precocious, uh, passed the exams for official position fairly early in his life, and was active for a time in the capital, Kaifeng, around the age of 40, the early Sun capital. Uh, he spent several years there, but he did, not, he did not continue in his official career. He was too fond of drinking, he was contemptuous of officialdom, he was a mm, non, he didn't fit. And he ended up living away from the cities, making his living as a painter doing landscapes. Um, but he was a proud, independent man. There was still some conflict at this time between his status as a scholar and his occupation as a painter. That is, uh, the painter's occupation was associated with the artisan class. We'll see this all coming to a head in the following period when the two really divide into uh, professional painters on the one hand who come to be kind of scorned and looked down on and scholar amateur painters on the other hand, uh, most of them a lot less capable than Li Chung, believe me. Anyway, we'll see the rise of one Runhua or literati or uh, scholar amateur painting in the, um, it isn't called that, but the way it comes to be called that in the later Northern Song. At any rate, um, Li Chung, to go on with him, painted the scenery of the Northern Plains, especially the scenery of Shandong in the Northeast, where he had been born. This desolate landscape with bare trees, bare trees that seem to be struggling for survival. And that is the real theme of his paintings, and a theme that somehow fitted his temperament, his own situation in the time. Uh, near the end of his life, he was invited by a patron to the city of Huayang, and he died there, died of drink, reportedly in 1967, as I say. Okay, here is this painting in the Palace Museum in Taipei, which I take to be a very fine example of the Li Chung style from the early period uh, detail. Here... The, uh, of the, the left side of the, um, uh, of the tree group. There's some sense of patterning here, especially in this upper part here, but not as much so as, for instance, the picture ascribed to Ching uh, Hao that we saw. It's not simple uh, repetition. And the twisting of the trunk of the old tree is quite fine. And uh, the branches and twigs generally uh, continue to show uh, energy continuing outward. That is, the energy of the brushwork stands for the energy flowing through the tree and animating, still animating this old tree as it struggles for survival. The next place, here is the right part of it <clears throat> with um, the, uh, the uh, a, a, a group of trees. And on the left side is the trunk of the old tree, and then there are other leafy trees and so on, a uh, kind of a mixture of trees and then other trees lower down uh, below. Well, um, this has more of that quality of natural tangle that seems to distinguish the best works of Li Chung and artists of this type. Uh, maybe, as I say, this is as close as we're going to get to Li Chung. An 11th century writer, Guo Roshu by name, writes of him, quote, his, at his atmosphere is mournful and thin. His misty forests are pure and desolate. His brush point is as fine as a needle, his ink infinitely slight or subtle, end quote. A later Sung writer, quoted by Max Lohr, writes of him, quote, It almost seemed as if his landscape were not, landscapes were not made with brush and ink, end quote. 
it would seem that he captured then more of the transient effects of, of nature, light and shadow, and uh, not a, quite apart from the growth of living things in his painting. And he exhibited a new mastery of ink monochrome for effects of space, it would appear. This sense of struggle, one sees in his painting, struggle for survival, gives a certain severity or austerity to his paintings, but also strength. Uh, in, in a, it's a taste that we can easily understand. I used to compare it to the shift from Tchaikovsky to Stravinsky in early 20th century music, something like that. Some artists of this time that has seemed to have turned violently away from all prettiness, blandishments, charming details, colorful scenery, all the things we've seen in earlier painting, some earlier painting, to strip nature down to its bare bones, so to speak. Um, the technical means developed by then were perfect for this, ink monochrome, certain kinds of brushwork, and particularly this kind of natural unre unrepeated brushwork that, that uh, somehow parallels the growth of living things in the movement of the artist's hand. Okay. For Chinese, this style and this type of subject symbolizes the un uncompromising tough-mindedness, endurance through hardship, a very important theme. And um, pine trees, as many of you know, in later times are used often as an analogy or a, a symbol for the uh, noble man who somehow stands tall through hard times, through the winter without changing. Okay, um, the next please. Okay, here is... Um, a painting attributed to Li Chung titled Trees on a Plain, for obvious reasons. Um, this is in a Japanese collection, the former Yamamoto Tejiro collection, later Inokuma. Inokuma was a kind of disciple of Yamamoto, and he has his private museum in Yokkaichi. I, I could talk about a visit there, but that's another subject. At any rate, it's in a Japanese collection. A lot of very fine paintings by or attributed to the great early masters of landscape and so on, came into Japan in the early 20th century, when Japanese began to try to overcome the limitations of their collections. They had collected fine Chinese paintings in earlier times, but they didn't have paintings by or ascribed to these great early landscape masters, Dungan, Juron, and so on. And they began trying to buy them. And anyway, that's another subject. But um, there are a number of very fine paintings attributed to these early masters in Japanese collections from that time. This is a large hanging scroll, in contrast to most of what we've seen, uh, ink and white color on silk. It's a fine work, seems an original, that is not a copy, but probably, again, a bit later. The painting of the earth masses in the foreground particularly remind us rather of Guo Xi, whom we'll see, the Li Chung pupil, active later in the 11th century. Um, Anyway, a very fine early painting of this type with pine, tall pine trees, the old tree, the old broken tree to the left here, just as a kind of stump or a sharp point, and then uh, other kinds of vegetation elsewhere. And then this modeling of the rocks, which, um, uh, uh, as I say, is more gouache like and a stream coming out of the distance and pouring into the foreground. Very fine painting, and then a vista behind. Uh, this kind of painting with tall trees and a long uh, vista over uh, eroded landscape becomes uh, typical of the uh, Li Chang school. We have a number of them, which is a particularly fine example. The next, please. And here, this is another so-called Li Chang painting in Japan, similarly one that came in with the, in this early 20th century, a big wave of acquisition of important early paintings in Japan. At any rate, this one is in the um, Osaka Municipal Museum, the former Abe collection, and it is uh, titled Reading the Tablet, or Reading the Stele, uh, uh, for obvious reasons. A traveler here, seen on his donkey, is it in any way, uh, wearing a broad hat, accompanied by a servant with a long staff carrying the luggage, um, stops on his journey through the landscape to read the text of a stone uh, tablet set up, as these were set up sometimes to commemorate some historical event or to record a person or whatever. And um, 
the painting is supposed to have been Lee, Lee Chung, painted by Li Chung with the figures done by another artist, Wang Xiao. And this is, it's known from texts again that Li Chung sometimes asked another artist to paint in the figures for him. He was not especially interested in figures and didn't do them, or so maybe he didn't feel that he did them really adequately. Well, this is a copy, but it's an important copy of an early composition, probably. The slope coming down at the left here, uh, the, that kind of entrance into the picture probably isn't so early. And the trees, oh, anyway, without, without going into the detail, I don't have details of this anyway. Let me just say that it's an important early copy of a composition uh, by Li Chang, or probably by Li Chang, recorded as by Li Chang, and important as that. Max Lohr has a good discussion of Li Chang in his book, but then he reproduces to represent him three paintings that really shouldn't be there, including an album leaf that's by, obviously by Wang Hui, 17th century master, recognizably in his style. Ming Qing painting was not sufficiently studied in the West in Lohr's time, and he didn't, he didn't have that what uh, visual familiarity with Ming Qing paintings that we now have. Um, Chinese connoisseurs, on the other hand, like Cici Wang, could recognize immediately that this was a Wang, Wang Hui painting, but no Chinese of Wang's generation was capable of the art historical analysis and writing that Lur could do. So the great comprehensive history, which should have combined both, uh, didn't, didn't get done, as I've said. Okay, anyway, then, the next, please. Oh, this is a, here is a large painting in the Metropolitan Museum called Travelers in a Wintry Forest. Uh, a big picture with an inscription. I don't know if it's still there, but there was an inscription mounted across the top, attributing it to, attributing it to Li Chang, written by Zhang Da Chen. And it used to be there anyway. And for me, that gives away its true origin. For me, it is not believable as a really early painting. Um, and, um, well, I won't just try to show why in detail. Again, it is in my on my website as among the paintings that I take to be by Zhang Da Chen. Uh, here is the figure, uh, which somehow isn't right for an early uh, figure. The trees are sort of what mixed up. You can't tell what uh, what part of the branches and twigs belong to which tree and so on. And here, the earth masses. The earth masses here are um, um, don't have any brushwork at all. They're spongy. Uh, ink sort of push, put put on in a in a rough way without any brush strokes. The same kind of drawing that Zhang used in a, another work, purportedly by an early master, and which is in the same museum. I'll say that and then leave it with enough, enough said. The next, please. This is a, a painting in the Palace Museum in Taipei uh, of the type that comes to be associated with, with Li Chang. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's attributed to him, but I put it on just an example of this kind of uh, schoolwork that, or, that comes from Li Chang. This may be actually late Song or something like that, Yuan Dynasty maybe. Uh, bear trees, a tangle of bear trees in the foreground, a house down below at the left, as we'll see if we, in the detail in a minute, and then the landscape stretching back to hills. There are lots of quite a number of, of, of fine paintings of this type. It becomes a popular type for obvious reasons and is done by all kinds of artists. Here, here's the detail. Yeah, uh, and you see the houses and so on under the trees. On the other hand, if you look at the old tree here and if you look at how the branch turns into the, uh, the, the, the smaller branches and twigs and you look at the way it twists and so on, you see this is a mannered picture. It, uh, it's not somebody who really even tries to understand the growth of living things or to create that effect of naturalness that the really good early paintings have. Okay, enough of that. I will only mention here and bring back in the next lecture, when I think it belongs, a very fine painting in the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City, one of Sickman's major acquisitions. It has an attribution to Li Chung which in my opinion doesn't mean much. Paintings with bare trees were often attributed loosely to Li Chung. The painting belongs by style in the 11th century, the Northern Song, and I'll introduce it there and talk about it then. Yeah, here's a, a hand scroll that's in the Liaoning Museum. Very dark. I have only slides made from reproductions, and they show much more than 
the uh, uh, you would if you were able to see the original because as I say it's very dark and hard to see. This is attributed to Li Chang, old attribution, former Manchu Imperial Household Collection, inscription by the Chenlong Emperor in the upper right here, his seals, etc. So it's one of those paintings that were taken by the last emperor and his brother uh, away from the palace and taken up to the northeast, up to Manchuria and so on. Well, um, yeah, uh, the, uh, it's an old and fine painting. Yang Run Kai, who was a leading art historian and the former director of the Liaoning Museum, discovered this and has written about it and takes it very seriously as a real Li Chung. I don't know it from the original, and I only uh, know it from reproduction, so I'll only, at the time we visited the Liaoning Museum, it wasn't there. We were not shown this picture. So I'll offer only a very tentative opinion. It's impressive as a picture, as you can see. I mean, it's obviously impressive, and it's, and it's old and it's fine. But at the same time, it seems to me too diverse in its forms, almost cluttered uh, for an early Sung work. There's not enough consistency in it. Paintings of this kind, let's have the next, please. Let's go on. Here's the, uh, a slide of the early section of it. Shenlong Emperor's inscription in the upper right, and uh, so on. Paintings of this kind with... Um, Mm, uh, with uh, somewhat eclectic in uh, uh, various elements of style from different, what seems to be different periods and so on, are um, belong to a later period in the Song, done by local artists, uh, not the pure versions of the style anymore. That's been left behind. Well, I think it's, I think as I said, it's fine, but it's by a sort of Li Chung follower. Uh, now here, here's another side of the, of the later part of it. It's a little like the painting in the Osaka Museum attributed to Shu Daoning, which we saw. That is not quite so um, atmospheric and varied and so on as this, but it's in the same direction. And I think that both paintings may well be um, early Southern Sung, or anyway, Southern Sung. The next, uh, please, here. Yeah, here's, here's an even closer detail of it. Well, uh, as I say, I, can't, I shouldn't talk about it really seriously because I haven't seen it in the original, and even if I did see it in the original, I wouldn't see it as clearly as this. But there is so much going on in this picture, and there's so much that uh, doesn't easily go together, so to speak. It's so kind of scenic and varied and whatever, um, in a way that I don't think uh, belongs to the early period. Okay, now <clears throat> I'll talk about some at the end here, uh, some things about landscape of the time, not particularly Li Shang, and um, with, with putting putting on the screen some of the paintings we've seen, some of the important ones, Ching Hao, Guantong, Dung Ran, Li Chung. Um, well, after looking at these landscapes, problematic as they may be in dating and attribution, we can understand better, I think, the problems that landscapists of this time were grappling with. First, the problem of variety versus unity, how to do away with distracting diversity of detail, and at the same time keep the painting interesting, or somehow subordinate the detail to the whole. Um, effects of grandeur, of massiveness, but not with a single simple form. It's too risky for that still. Uh, nor could the painting be broken up into units as in a kind of additive composition. It had to have some kind of stronger unification than that. Uh, the problem of effects of distance and depth, which the artists are still dealing with in their way. Uh, the treatment of surface, convexity versus texture. I say that because defining the texture of earth and rocky masses tended to flatten them. Now this is the main argument of an article I wrote and published in 1962 titled Some Rocks in Early Chinese Painting. And I try to see how artists gradually overcame this uh, seeming conflict between texture and uh, mass, convexity. Um, this article and was based on a lecture I went, went around giving after we had done the ph photographing for my Skira book on, in Taiwan. And so we had big 8 by 10 transparencies from which we could make detailed slides. And I had my Fourier photographer do that. And it was possible as never before to talk about uh, close-up details in these paintings. Before we had only had black and white reproduction of the holes. So at any rate, uh, so, so I was doing this lecture on, on, on that subject, okay. 
At any rate, behind all these uh, problems are the big problem of how to give import or human meaning to landscape painting, how to make it something more than a mere picture of scenery. It's, um, these are all old problems, and now they are confronting artists with new urgency. Before going on, I put on the screen two major paintings that I'll discuss in the next lecture by artists who are named Yen Wen Gui and Fan Quan, actual signed works we're going to see finally. And uh, these are anti uh, I'm showing them as anticipations of what we'll be seeing then. So much for this lecture. How much all these, or how these all affected painting, is something we'll see in the following lecture, which will be on the great landscapists of the Northern Sung period.